Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode four of the Nancy Drew Game Ranking Series, where we're going to be covering every single Nancy Drew game from the worst to the best, all 33 of them, in the category of soundtracks and music. I'm your host, Jameson. And I'm Julian. And this was this this was the hardest one to make, without a doubt. It's it's a topic that Jamie and I feel very passionately about. Music it extends to all video games. It's something that I critique and I love so much. And the Nancy Drew game franchise excels in music. Every single track is, it's just so hard to rank. This is post-production that I'm recording this, but it is super, super important that we give you a quick rundown of the criteria that Julian and I use to rank all the music and soundtracks for this franchise. So above all, music is ranked in three major categories. First one is whether or not a soundtrack is tight or loose. A tight soundtrack would be a soundtrack that you cannot mistake for any other game. It's unique, it buys into the cultures and ethnic themes of the game that it's playing for, and it has a sound to it that can't be imitated or mistaken for any other game. Where on the other hand, a loose soundtrack would be a more generic soundtrack for a game. You could mistake it for another game, you could lift it into another game and maybe not even notice, and typically there's nothing so memorable about the melodies or the tones or instruments or anything like that. Moving into the second piece of criteria is whether or not a soundtrack has variation. Some soundtracks will just have, you know, non-stop spooky music, and then, you know, a victory theme or a danger theme, and that's it. Whereas other soundtracks will have quite the bit of musical diversity when it comes to both the kinds of instruments that they use in the tracks, plus the kinds of tones that are conveyed by the music. And then finally, of course, does it sound good? Some of the highest ranking soundtracks on this list got there almost entirely from the goodwill they bought of being extremely fun to listen to or just altogether catchy. Seeing as today is all about the music, this video is not going to have a very visual aspect to it, so we'll probably just have a thumbnail up per game, but there will be a lot of music played on its own. For the first 20 to 25 games on this list, we will play four songs from each soundtrack minimum. That means by the end of this video, we will have showcased 150 or more Nancy Drew songs individually. Because as we reach the top 15, top 10, and especially top 5, we're going to break that rule and play bonus tracks per game when and as it is necessary. The four tracks that will be played per game go in the following order. First, we will have an opener track to introduce the game, when we'll have that title on the screen as we won't always introduce it by name. Next, Julian and I will each pick our favorite song from the game, play it, and talk about it. And then finally, we will play a closer track. As the list progresses, we will have bonus tracks for games between our favorites and the closer, and those will always be something, you know, just an interesting tidbit of information, or something otherwise fun to listen to from the game. A side note that I just wanted to apologize real quick as to how long this list was in production, actually. This video took much longer to edit, almost more than twice as long as the last episode, even if it's not the longest one in the series, because I had to edit the commentary in the same pace with the music the whole way through. And occasionally, you make one slight bump and you have to go right back to the beginning and make sure everything's dragged into place, which did happen multiple times. And then finally, I think it cannot be overstated that there are no bad soundtracks in this franchise. Unlike any other category that we've done before, there really isn't a single bad contender. Even whatever we're going to play for number 33, the worst soundtrack on this list, there's still a lot of songs in that game that Julian and I both personally love. We wanted to give a special thanks and credit, of course, to Kevin Manthe, the original composer of the franchise, who I believe did games 1 through 26 soundtrack, then Thomas Reagan, who took over with Deadly Device all the way up to Sea of Darkness, and then finally the new crew from Midnight in Salem, which was a bit more diverse bunch, and we will have their credits in the description. 33 games in, and these people have made phenomenally atmospheric soundtracks that we listen to all the time when working, studying, or just trying to relax. You can fight us in the comments whenever you see fit, but I just want to make sure it's absolutely clear. In Julian and I's humble opinion, more so than any other list in this ranking series, there are no bad entries. The list simply goes from good to better to best. Hope everybody enjoys this episode, and also shout out to JCat. Coming in then, at number 33, in our personal opinion, the worst soundtrack in the franchise is still a good one, but all the same, we have game number 28, The Ghost of Thornton Hall. Now, I imagine a lot of people are I'm pretty shocked at that pick, but we have a very good uh, explanation why, and that's because a lot of this game's music, it's not really music, it's more so just ambient background noise, and it's very well fitting, but it's not really music. I can name maybe one or two melodies from this game. Right, and they're even repeated in a couple of songs. It's yeah. just, it's supposed to be 
It's kind of hard to explain. Julian's favorite track, I believe, went to Dark, which is the title theme of Ghost of Thornton Hall. Totally, you, you booted up. Totally. Yeah. So Dark is by far my favorite track in the game, and it's because, while it is, it's kind of like half and half ambience and music, but you get that iconic trombone. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, that, it's a sinister trombone. It is... Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it is up to something. Yeah, it's really awesome. It's what you hear when you boot the game up, and it always rings out in my head. My favorite track for this game is the Ghost track, which I believe Julian was actually outspoken about not liking. Mm -hmm. This is the one that a lot of you probably recognize as having the ghostly wailing and singing in it. And personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the singing myself in this track, but I love the halfway point after the crescendo, where it just goes into this really, really foggy and quiet piano with like an organ in the background. Just a bias alert right here, the organ is my all-time favorite instrument, and I will be showing blatant bias and favoritism to games that incorporate an organ <laughs> in the soundtrack, <laughs> so that, that's something that you should be warned of and aware of, but I just love the little dainty piano in this bit. Yeah, Ghost is a good track. I uh, The wailing, you know, can get to be a bit too much for me, <laughs> but I think it's really good. It's very fitting, at least. And then finally, of course, this is the reason why this game was so hard to hold back. It's because it has one of the more iconic vocal songs in the franchise, and that is Charlotte Thornton's Ladybug song. It only plays whenever there's a sighting of Charlotte Thornton, mm -hmm. and I'm not even mad, because that just adds to the mystique of the song. Definitely. It would not be the same song if it just played gener generically everywhere. Oh yeah, that'd be horrible. But all the same, the Ladybug song added a layer of mystique to the soundtrack that while almost no other game has copied, it's not enough to save the rest of the atmospheric ambiance that is Ghost of Thornton Hall. Alright guys, moving on to the 32nd best soundtrack of Nancy Drew Games, we have Tomb of the Lost Queen. So, Tomb of the Lost Queen is a perfect example of a tight-fitting soundtrack. If you played any song from this game, I, I would be surprised if anybody would be able to s mistake it for anything that is not Tomb of the Lost Queen. <laughs> exactly. It's all very foreign to me. So why is it this high up on the list? It's because there's little to no variation between each track. Y you know, I, I can barely differentiate which tracks are which because they're all so similar sounding. And I just have to hold it against that game. There's no variation like where there is in other games. Really, it just has two tones in this game. There's happy, and then there's spooky, decrepit tomb. So the intro track we went with, Ancient, it's a really good track. It's, I believe it's what you hear when you boot up the game, right? Oh it's yeah, that's the title theme of this yeah, one Yeah, it's got that like xylophone going across, you know. It's pretty iconic, but my favorite is definitely the dance track. Dance is so upbeat, it's so catchy, you hear it upstairs, you hear it in the tomb too. I don't know, it just rings out in my head. Dance is, it probably can be called the single catchiest track in this game. You if, get tambourines in here, you just get a bunch of really weird Egyptian percussion instruments in yeah, That's what I like about it. And then in a similar vein as Dance, my favorite is actually the camp track. And it sounds a lot like dance in terms of tone. Like I said, the happy tracks in this game sound very similar to each other. But my favorite part of camp has to be this little bridge towards the end of it, where everything just kind of changes and it becomes a very intense, almost cinematic song. Like you're overseeing the pyramids being built in the shoes of Ramses II. I always thought that that was a very nice musical interlude at the end of a rather upbeat track, so I totally appreciate it for that. Lastly, the bonus track. This is the one that is possibly the most different. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, it's a uh, it's one of the more simplistic tracks in the franchise. Yeah, played on like a like a snake charmer flute. The entire track too. It's just on this flute. We have absolutely no idea what these instruments are called. Please excuse our ineptitude, but this, <laughs> this is hymn, and hymn plays when you're down in the crypts 
finding new tombs, opening secret passageways, being the first person into a room that no one's been in for the past 2,000 years. And it's just such a... Well, except for the original excavation team. Okay, yeah, the guys are... <laughs> okay, the, the past 60 years, but... Still, it's got a very, very haunting and uncomfortable vibe to it that really made it stand out to me further than any of the other soundtracks in this game. Now on the other side of the spectrum, for game number 31, we have the opposite of a tight-fitting soundtrack. A soundtrack that you could easily mistake for another, any other game, mm -hmm. and that is game number 25, Alibi in Ashes. Alibi in Ashes, as a soundtrack, relied a lot on strings and piano, as did a lot of the other more domestic games in the franchise. You hear it a lot... Like we said, games 1, 2, and 3, and a little bit of 8, I'd say, you could all mistake for each other. And this this fits into that group, too. There's a lot of plucked string, a lot of violin, a lot of piano, and that's really just about all the palette it does have. Now, I can award it briefly for changing things up just a little bit with some xylophone, and that's seen a lot in my personal favorite track, the police track. Really, the police track to me is probably the grooviest in the game. You can only describe the music so much, so I think that it, the sounds just kind of speak for themselves. Okay, so my favorite track by far is Spy, and I think Spy is so easily able to be associated with Brenda Carlton's character, which kind of gives it bonus points in my opinion, but it's so catchy. You know, you get that like plucked string staccato note, whatever that is at the beginning. That, that melody is so catchy, and I think it's so easily attributed to Brenda Carlton's character because she's known to just like do whatever it takes to get the inside scoop. Spy She's on the people. Snoop, yeah. Exactly, and you can totally, there's something about this track that just goes hand in hand with like snooping around or sleuthing. I mean, it's called Spy. So this will be a little bit of a two-part discussion then. The closer for this track will also make a nice segue into number 30 on this list. Because part of the reason why I ranked Alibi and Ashes a little low is because this final track we're going to play, the home track of Nancy's House, is a little too similar and easily confused for a track earlier on in the franchise. So without further ado, we'll top off Ashes with this song and segue into game number 30. So how'd you like that intro, guys? Smooth, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Secrets Can Kill, first Nancy Drew game ever, right? Her interactive was still figuring out what they wanted to do, and the soundtrack for this game, it's not very outstanding. But I do have a favorite track, and that's the 50s Diner, that's what it's called. It's what you hear at Maxine's, and it's just... can't even begin to describe it. It's just upbeat, totally fitting with the theme of Maxine's. It's a rock and roll 50s diner. <laughs> exactly. My favorite track in this game is uh, kind of the most getting in the mood of snooping around the library trying to find clues from a psychic overlord telling you how this kid got killed, and that is Mystery Light. Mist Light just has a real simple piano with that classic ominous woodwind. I, I want to say clarinet could be a bassoon, could be an oboe, I don't know, I failed band class, so <laughs> <laughs> let's, I, let's, let's just assume that it is a snaky woodwind sound. The last bonus track we'll cover for this game is the title theme that you hear in the original Secrets Can Kill, actually, because all the way back then in 1999, or is it 98? It was 98 when this game came out. That's right, 98. We didn't have the iconic Nancy Drew opening on, like, the, the book loading screen, you know? We had this. So really, we included this one as just kind of a little piece of trivia for those who haven't actually been able to play Secrets and Kill, to think that this is the first track any player of this franchise ever heard back in 1998. 
And it kind of begs the question, if every other game in the franchise had a custom theme on the title screen, what would it be? A little too intense for me. <laughs> Alrighty guys, coming in next on the list, 29th spot, we have Shattered Medallion. This could be the first time that Shattered Medallion has escaped the 30s. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it could. <laughs> and not by a very big margin. Uh, it's so high up here is because there's really nothing special about it. There's a couple bangers here and there that we'll cover, but like, nothing outstanding. Yeah, so we'll, we'll make quick work of this one. Julian... Actually, you know, there was a discussion in our Discord lately that Shatter Medallion, despite all of its other flaws, does have a pretty decent soundtrack. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. I know my track by far is Tranquility, and I think it goes hand in hand so well with New Zealand, where, you know, the game actually takes place. You hear Tranquility uh, outside the... Doubtful sound? Doubtful sound, like, that's right. You hear it out there when you're in, like, the meadows and everything, pretty much anywhere there's open green scenery, and it's so pretty guys i could go to sleep listening to this music i definitely study to it like it's definitely the part of the game that i like the most in my opinion tranquility is a little bit loose i could probably mistake it for some of the rolling hills of scotland themes from silent spy but i understand where the what the appeal is Personally, I think that I'm more of a fan of the manufactured and artificial game show music of this soundtrack. Being Puzzles, mm -hmm. I think, is probably one of the most catchy songs in the game. Puzzles is definitely my second favorite. And really, it hardly only plays anywhere besides the Puzzle Palace, which is aptly named for. <laughs> but I, I think it's just a nice, slow, steady beat, super casual, bringing back that xylophone. They did a lot with xylophone in this franchise. I never realized that till I sat down to make this list. But Puzzles totally has its place as one of the better tracks in this game. And then finally, as our closer, we have an amalgamation of the two, Tranquility and Puzzles combined, bringing the xylophone of the artificial game show, combined with the nice orchestral acoustic noises of the peaceful parts of this game, we have Exploration. You know, I never actually thought of it that way. Yeah, you've got the, the nice little xylophonic melody. <laughs> I suppose that, I, I guess that's a word, grammatically. Coming up next at number 28, we have what is probably without a doubt the most cinematic Nancy Drew soundtrack, <laughs> and also longest, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Midnight in Salem. So, uh, the game of all the controversy, Midnight in Salem's soundtrack, it doesn't feel like a video game soundtrack almost, and it certainly doesn't feel like fitting to this game. I'll say it over and over and over, it is the one phrase to sum up this game, should have been a movie. <laughs> Everything about it was just so intentionally trying to be cinematic, but on the Unity engine it just kind of fell apart. I mean, you, you definitely see that in the soundtrack. So where this game gets bonus points, and what I really praise it for, is its distinct day and night track. It's actually the same track with subtle differences, and it added so much to the game. I know my favorite track is Town Square, but what's even cooler is there's a different Town Square variation, which is so unique. In the same vein, we introed with the night version of puzzles, which I personally think is a much better version of the puzzles track. When you play in the daytime and you try to solve a puzzle in this game, you will hear this. But if you attempt the same puzzle during the nighttime segments of the game, you'll hear this instead. There's some very subtle differences in which instruments they take away from each track. You know, they're the same track, but I just think that's interesting. I'm glad that they did that. Now, there is more things to critique about Midnight in Salem than just the way that the music sounds. They kind of changed the whole sound structure of the franchise, and really, we could expect the rest of the soundtracks to be like this going on if, if Game 34, you know, ever happens. <laughs> so that is that instead of tracks kind of playing 
by, I guess, a random number generator or something where you, you wander around and then there's like a pool of which track is gonna play. Sometimes there's just silence. In this game, there is always a song playing per location. Like this, I didn't like that. Yeah, the town square track will always play in the town square. And if it's night, it'll just play the night version. The courthouse track will always play in the courthouse. The forest track will always play in the forest. Whenever you do a puzzle, it will be the puzzle track. Doesn't matter if you're solving a great big cipher wheel at the end of the game, or if you're just piecing together a torn up note, that is the music you will hear. And really, I feel like there were some upsides to this, because again, you got my favorite track in the game, Luminous Infusions. So that, that I think was a great way of building atmosphere into the soundtrack, which is that Lauren Holt's little tea shop in Apothecary she has this groovy soundtrack playing. It's much different from everything else in this game. And it's also a great segue into something I want to get into in a minute called diegetic and non-diegetic music. A really brief vocabulary lesson for cinema, I guess. Non-diegetic music is music that only the audience can hear in any given game or movie or any kind of media that includes a soundtrack. And that really is the entire franchise when it comes to Nancy Drew music. It's all non-diegetic for the most part. But this game has diegetic music too, meaning that it's being produced somewhere in the fictional world and the characters can hear it. You see, and you see this a lot in places like Luminous Infusions, as well as the car radio, which I think makes a bonus extra track in this game, because it did do something pretty original, pretty new, that I thought was a great highlight in Midnight in Salem. And that was the car radio puzzle with May Perry and Deirdre. This, this is just a short little anecdote from the game for those who couldn't play it. At one point in Midnight in Salem, it's the end of the first night and you're driving back to the Perry house with Deirdre and there's this song playing on the radio that kind of just sounds like a Tame Impala ripoff. We'll have, <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have it going in the background here. And uh, Nancy says, oh, I like this song. And Deirdre's just like, really? I don't know, they kind of fell off after they changed their bassist and Julian just wasn't paying attention. And then when you get into the house, May, who's being antisocial, is listening to the same song. And you go up there and say, hey, I like this song. May, May goes, really, you listen to these guys? And Nancy has the choice to say, yeah, but they kind of fell off since they changed their bassist, or ever since they changed their drummer. And if you get it wrong, then May doesn't trust you as much. But if you get it right, she starts to warm up to you. And I thought that was a great way of using the soundtrack of a game to bond and try to gain the trust of another character. If they keep on building on premises like that in any more games they make, I would be super happy to see that. That was a really impressive part of the game to me, and I'm glad they threw that in. The whole diegetic music part, I think it's something to expand upon in future games, and if we get similar puzzles like that, then that'd be kind of cool, because it's kind of making the player be more alert. Well, anyways, I'm sure you guys have had enough Midnight in Salem then. I know that we covered a little bit more of that than we're used to for any of these soundtracks, but there was a lot to be said about this very controversial game. So now, moving to a less controversial game, but all the more very controversial pick on this list, and we have the receipts. We're going to justify this one. Game 21. Warnings at Waverly Academy, coming in at number 27 on the list. Now, a lot of people, I presume, are shocked at that. We can elaborate why, but first we have to get into some of the more amazing tracks this game has produced. This and game has like four tracks that are all A pluses, and we're going to cover them all back to back right now. So mm -hmm. the first one that you heard at the beginning, that was the Black Cat theme, which I think is just a perfect, ominous, chilling kind of song in this game. And next up, I want to cover Waverly. Waverly is just the perfect idol music. It's... It, it's got just this dainty and almost preppy feel to it, perfect for the school that we're at in this environment. And at the same time, it's just got a nice little steady climb and then goes back down. It's nothing spectacular, but perfectly ambient. You could loop this track and I would never notice and end up listening to it for hours. So something I'll casually bring up throughout this review is if a, if a song makes it in my top 10 of all time or not, for individual tracks of course, Storm is definitely in my top 10. It is so beautiful, it's like a minute long track, maybe a little bit more, but when you listen to it, it feels like an entire story or play, it's just, it's going on while you're listening to this. It's so intense, it gradually becomes more intense, like a storm. It's such and, a slow burn, I love it. Yeah, it's beautiful.
That final crescendo at the end when everything just comes toppling down, it's just such a great rising action in a song. Words can't describe just how much I love that track. And then finally, we got like, you know, the really, really catchy one in the game that a lot of people fondly remember, Gossip Track. This is this is the upbeat, cheery, perky track. I, I can't even think of what the instruments are in it at the moment. This is the music of making snacks, working snack shop duty, and he overhearing everyone talking about, is he stealing <laughs> people's boyfriends and stuff like that. And really, I think Gossip is easily one of the catchier tracks in the franchise. I, there's a couple that are similar tone-wise, and like Deadly Device, I think, but still, it's, it's super cool. That's four great tracks from this game, four outstanding tracks. I'd call those four tracks probably better, or at least could give a run for the money of any other track we've lived so far on this list. Why is it number 27 on our list, though? Because those are literally the only four tracks in this game. Yeah, they reuse pretty much straight plagiarizing other like classical pieces. Okay, okay. Uh, which it's not plagiarism if the <laughs> author's been dead for 2200 years. I, you know what I mean though, and it, that goes with Mel's character, which is pretty cool because you can hear her practicing virtually anywhere inside of the building, yeah, but yeah. It, it gets reused so much and it's not original pieces either. So really, there's one there's one other original score track that we didn't cover, that's Hollowell. Hollowell's nothing really to write home about, so I'm not gonna cover it here, but I am not kidding when I say this. This game has by far the smallest original score of any Nancy Drew game. Could there, possibly be symbolic of like how confined and how small the area is. Could also be symbolic that they literally dumped 85% of their budget into getting all their suspects and voice actors. <laughs> okay, maybe that's a fair point. Yeah, but I, I, I feel like it's a fair trade-off because you hardly notice how few songs there are in this game because so much of the empty space in the soundtrack is just filled with Giuseppe Tartini in violin and Johann Sebastian Bach. That's, that is no exaggeration. There are five original score tracks in this game by Kevin Manthe, and then literally at least seven or eight instrumentals, of which most of them are just the cello. Then there's piano, then there's violin, and it's, they're all in like 15, 20 second bursts, and a lot of them repeat consecutively, and yeah, I don't know. For that, as great as the original pieces of this game are, there's not enough of them. Exactly. It's, it's really weird. I didn't notice it until I sat down and listened to the soundtrack. It's about 8 minutes at most of original score, and then 16 minutes of cello. But listen to Storm, though, because that one's good. Yeah. All right, coming up now at number 26, we have a tight-fitting soundtrack, but a little short and lackluster, and that is The Creature of Capu K. What you guys just heard there was the immersion trick, and one of my favorite instruments of all time is actually the ukulele, which, it's just perfect. It's, you know, the, it's the most prominent instrument in that track. Yeah, it's the most prominent instrument in this whole game, I'd say, and, and rightfully so, because it's, you know, one of the most famous native Hawaiian instruments, if I'm not mistaken. And really, this game capitalized on the ukulele so, so hard, and I'm mm -hmm. glad that they did. But really, that's just about all that there is in this game. But you could not mistake any track from this game for another game. Maybe Ransom of the Seven Ships, if you were listening for just tropical vibes. No, I still think something about this just speaks Hawaii. I think it's the ukulele, honestly. Yeah, and besides from that, there's a lot of really natural sounding noises in this. It's almost like the leaves swaying in the wind. You kind of hear some waves crashing mm -hmm. on some of the tracks, Yeah, there's some ambient stuff. Uh, but my favorite track by far is Bugs. It is oh. the most, like... Jazziest xylophone a, a in the world. Sporadic xylophone, yeah. <laughs> it, it makes you think of Bugs. It's the dozen little critters of this game, you know? It's, it's Dr. Quigley Kim's track for sure. So sporadic, so all over the place. And then there's also a lot more chill tracks in this game too. We're gonna we're gonna burn right through this soundtrack because it is a little bit short and a lot of the sounds are very similar, but you gotta love the nice peaceful Hawaiian vacation vibes of Aloha. Aloha is just such a nice, peaceful almost exotic kind of track, but also just nice and chill. And really, when I played this game, the number one thing that I was looking for was the vibes of being on a Hawaiian vacation. And this is the number one track that without a doubt delivered that atmosphere. 
The last track we'll cover, kind of a bonus track here, is the, I get, yeah, it's it's a danger track. It's called Men in Yellow, and you hear it. It's in the instance where you're undercover. With Agent all the, Dewey Fighterman. Yeah, I was trying to remember the dude's name. Dewey Fighterman, yeah. You're undercover as that guy, and you're sneaking through they the figure Healy, out Healy there, They figure out there's a breach. Uh, I, I don't want to give away too much spoilers of the sequence, because it's probably the most exciting part of the game, mm -hmm. you know, after having to do four hours of frass puzzle, but... This was, like, the extent of tropical danger can go. I'm not that big a fan of it, but for what it's worth, they pulled it off, and it has a cool name. Yeah, that's, that's really why we chose this one. Cool name. Coming up next, this one is a great soundtrack, but there's one mortal sin that this that this game made in the soundtrack that we had to hold it back for. One of my personal favorite sounds of the entire franchise is The Phantom of Venice for number 25. So that first track, Creep, right there, I think that is the perfect track of this game's opening. The way that this game starts is, you know, it's got that weird in medias res Fight Club David Fincher style where it starts out of order <laughs> and Nancy's just like, what could be, how did this go so wrong? What could be better than waking up in Venice, Italy? And then the game, most of the time, it can be a different track sometimes too, but it begins with just Nancy waking up in her bed as that iconic climb begins with the creep track don't even ask me why it's called creep i don't know there's a lot of weird titles for the tracks in this game mm -hmm. i assume that they have to do something with carnival traditions but i think that it's such a nice acoustic sound to it uh my favorite track is called tourist i'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's definitely the most iconic track of this game So to me, Tourist is definitely the track that I would most associate with a Venetian vacation. It's the very peaceful and upright, upbeat kind of track that makes you think of, dang, Venice is such a beautiful place, I'd, lo I'd love to spend a couple weeks there sometime. Because really, that's that was a very split theme in this game of how, you know, Venice is such a beautiful city and there's so much to do, so many gondola drivers you can pay to sing for you, <laughs> which was another fun part of this town track. But it's kind of split because Nancy's here on business, she's not here for fun. Jamie's favorite track is so unique. That's no. the one word I would call it. Okay, okay, so Goblin, to me, is one of the single greatest suspense tracks in the entire franchise. It's very, very easily an unsettling track. There's a very uncomfortable tone to it throughout the whole thing, right from the beginning, that I think is just enchanting. It's cinematic in a good way. And then halfway through the song, there comes this unnatural, very, very tense crescendo of strings There's a very, very intense crescendo of strings in the middle part of this track that is just so intense. It's it's the sound of like making a grim realization or something of the sort. And without a doubt, I think that this is the single most enchanting part of this soundtrack. It's interesting that he thinks that because I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, <I'm laughs> and I always... guess that that speaks to the game, like how wide of a variety its music is and everything which you know bonus points too it's pretty cool yeah it's definitely to me a very very particularly intense soundtrack without being super fast paced so what's this game's grave sin we mentioned earlier well it's it's reuse of a danger track yeah. all the way from case number three now don't ask me how this happened if i had to guess they probably made the game and then post-production they were like Holy crap! We forgot. We forgot to tell Kevin to make us a danger track. <laughs> what are we gonna do? We forgot to. We forgot to sign him on for one of those. And so the developers probably just thought, well, we have a danger track for every game. Just pick whichever one is, you know, the most cookie cutter and throw it into this one. And it didn't work. It didn't work at all. <laughs> they, they literally. It's laughable. They lifted right from Message in a Haunted Mansion the danger track. And the the most shameful thing is that it starts with a fade in. It's it's not even like tr they're. That's the only distinguishing difference between this and the danger from Message in a Haunted Mansion. When you're in the final timed puzzle of this game in the ending, it's so 
off-putting to just hear the message in a Haunted Mansion soundtrack in Venice. Mm -hmm. And so that... And I feel like a large percentage of players can make that that realization too. Yeah, yeah. If you've played Message in a Haunted Mansion and then play this game, you, it, it won't slip by you. It juts out like a sore thumb. There's no way you're not going to recognize this track. It's, it's, a, it's a little immersion breaking too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we we got we got to make sure that we call our shots here. Phantom of Venice is definitely lower on the list than I'd like it to be just because of that lazy mistake on her interactive's part. Coming in at number 24 on our list, we have case number two, Stay Tuned for Danger, and the origin of the iconic Nancy Drew anthem we all know and love. So Stay Tuned for Danger, apart from having, you know, the iconic Nancy Drew intro that would stick for the franchise for so long and then eventually get remastered, it's an interesting soundtrack to me because it's kind of cookie cutter in some ways where some tracks are very familiar and, you know, you, they're easily loose-fitting tracks. They could be mistaken for Message in Ohana Mansion at times or even the original game. But one thing that I think it did really, really well and it shows in my favorite tracks in the game is the use of xylophone. I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna sound like an idiot if it's not actually a xylophone, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that it is. And both the tracks, Exterior Night, or maybe it's Exit Night, and Dwayne Night. I'll play them both back to back right here, and you can just hear how they took such a playful instrument and made it sound just a little bit suspicious. My favorite track in this game is probably, yeah, it's the stage track. It's where you hear on the stage. It's really good at being ominous. This track and the opening cinematic you get when you first walk onto the stage, the whole, I don't want to see you, Serena. And then every <laughs> time that you first enter the stage after that point, the first screen is always met with this song starting to play. And it's just such mm -hmm. a, it's such a nice climb it's so with the violin as you look at the set. It's so automatic, and not many modern games are like this, but it's like crossing an imaginary line when you enter the doorway, it's just this song plays. And not many cases I don't think are like that, today at least, but there's something about that element that I think adds to this game, is that there's another, there's something more to this stage. And then finally, for the bonus track of this game and our closer, I feel like you can't cover the Stay Tuned for Danger soundtrack without overlooking Lobby Day, or as most of you fondly or unfondly remember it as, the elevator music. It's literally just elevator music. The filter that they gave it makes it sound like it's coming through a 1985 elevator speaker. Well, see, I like it because it's in New York City. You're yeah. gonna get that, like... I, I see, that's the thing. It's a split track because, because it is a very lazy track, but it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be just in the Big Apple, all this, all sorts of hustle and bustle going on in New York City. And then you just walk into the lobby of this nice studio and they've got just, you know royalty-free elevator music playing. The reason it gets huge bonus points is because it has the original Nancy Drew song that they kept with all the games after. I don't know if it was originally intended for this, if Kevin was like, yeah, this is good for Stay Tuned for Danger, or if he was like, no, this is going to be the song. I, I, th I think it was made with the intention of being that song, because that intro track was for this game, STFD, that's the anthem of Stay Tuned for Danger, but make no mistake, the iconic Nancy Drew, da na 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 that is the song of the franchise. Coming in at 23 on our list, we have case number 31, The Labyrinth of Lies. While the ukulele is the instrument for Creature Capu Cave, the Spanish guitar is the instrument for this game. Okay, so Labyrinth of Lies, like, easily, has two of my favorite songs of all time. One of them way, way more than the other. I think, I'm just gonna go right now, favorite track in this game, 
festive. Festive is such a banger. If you throw me the aux cord, there is <laughs> there is a good chance I'm going to play this. It's got such a playful, catchy beat. I love the Spanish guitar because it just does not stop. It kind of sounds like it's lifted out of a Greek Scooby-Doo movie. I, I, I don't know. It, it really does just sound almost cartoonish in how catchy it is, but also so fitting to the theme. I would easily call this track a 10 out of 10. It is perfect. If anything, I wish it was longer. My favorite track in the game is Culture. It is another big Spanish guitar song. It's like a Spanish guitar solo almost. Yeah, it's, it is the sexiest track in maybe the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about it is just so cool. Uh, you definitely hear it most, I'd say, in the museum. Which and kind of doors too, yeah. yeah. Which goes hand in hand, culture, museum, It's there's cultural exhibits. I think it's pretty cool in that regard. But the Spanish guitar just speaks to me. This it's, so it's so good. This song makes me want to eat olives and feta cheese all day. <laughs> That's how Greek it is. It kind of gets points off as a game in general because of how repetitive the Spanish guitar is, but for what it's worth, its appearance is very much appreciated. Oh yeah, I, I can't hold against how much they used the track, and it was perfect for the tone, perfect for making it a tight soundtrack, and I'm really, I'm sad that those are the two main tracks that have it, because everything else in this game is either somewhat instrumental, like the pit orchestra on a play, and otherwise it's just very somber and quiet tracks. Case in point, you have the resigned track that comes in, I think, in the Underworld set of the game. It's very interesting as far as musical choices would go, because as it is, it's kind of just a generic track with just the strings going real emotional and dramatic and slow. And then halfway through it, someone starts singing. It's, it's like a man's vocals that are <laughs> kind of out of place. I, it, it definitely stands out from the other tracks, so we did want to include it as a bonus, if not the closer. It's only heard in the Underworld, which makes the song that much better because it's, it's pretty perfect for that. It's not a scary track by any means, but there's something more to it, and I think it's just perfect in the Underworld. Overall, Labyrinth of Lies, one of my favorite songs of all time it has in the festive track, but apart from that, the rest of it just kind of falls into place and it's not enough to move it so far up on the list. Coming in at number 22 on our list, we have game number 6, Secret of the Scarlet Hand. So Scarlet Hand, the alternate museum game, actually managed to beat Labyrinth of Lies by one point. And I think that's for having a more creative soundtrack. Definitely, it's a lot more creative. And we get another song here coming in at Julian's top 10. I am in love with the exotic trick. Exotic is just such, it's its the Mexican track. It's the game. iconic track of this game. It gets the catchiness bonus points. It's always stuck in my head. I could be like, I could be doing the most like irrelevant thing, unloading the dishwasher, and then it just slithering into my head is the It's unmistakable too. It's You hear the song and you always think, yeah, that's Secret of the Scarlet Hand. For it's sure. Super tight soundtrack. But then there's also so much variety in this game too. Monolith is my favorite. It's the gardens area, right? Yeah, yeah. Monolith is this really interesting climb of a track that really is well associated with the first time seeing the monolith, the massive pillar of stone that they've excavated out of a cave near Palenque. And it really is a mystifying track because there's so much mystery with this great big thing that you don't know what it's about. And I don't want to give away what the true purpose of the monolith is because I think it is a quite a the reveal. Yeah, I always associate Monolith with the garden area, but there's also something mysterious about it, especially at the end. It just gets gradually a little louder and louder, and then you get like a big cymbals clash at the end of it, and it's just a perfect way to wrap up that mysterious track. 
And then finally, as our bonus for Secret of the Scarlet Hand, we have the third variety of tracks in this game, which is admittedly a very, very strange choice, but I dig it, is the Pakal track, or the Dark track, where I guess the developers decided, hey, Kevin, we need you to recreate my enchanting. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how they attacked them with that, but really... These tracks are very, very creepy, very unsettling. They have abstract chanting and, you know, just vocals going on in the background. All sorts of just almost growling noises. <laughs> it's, it's the weirdest thing to try to explain. I know, because it's this... Keep in mind, the Mayan civilization was gone way before anyone had ever been to the area. They I th up and disappeared. I think you, you probably hear it most in, like, level 2, level 3 of the pyramid, right? The yeah, more you explore. in the gardens, too, sometimes, but it's totally the music of getting wrapped up in the museum's culture and what's going on with the Mayan mysteries. Mm -hmm. It does that so well. It's such, such a good game for music. Coming in now at number 21, one of the more sentimental and emotional soundtracks in the franchise, and for good reason, we have The Silent Spy. So it's interesting that you go with sentimental and emotional when there's two extremely different sides of oh, music to yeah. this game. There's the super intense upbeat spy music, which I like, and then there's the more emotional Kate Drew piano pieces, which I love. Like it's just, it's better and best, you know? If you haven't picked up by now, there's usually a key instrument, or a lot of the times there is associated with each game. For this, it is absolutely the bagpipes, given that it takes place in Scotland. That opening track you just heard, Traditions, is so pretty, especially when the bagpipes come in halfway. It just makes me think of Scotland scenery, it's all green, it's the beautiful meadows, similar to how like Loch Lomond is like that and everything. I am personally more of a fan of the kooky, upbeat, intense spy music, and that I think is perfect in stealth. The whole genre of spy music in this game is unlike any other kind of musical style that you've seen in any other game in the franchise. And I really like this one because it's it's the slow start. It's very, very tame at the beginning with this. Uh, it's all just percussion. You know, there's the cymbal chatter and everything. And then just the electric dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's definitely on the more spy oriented side of the game yeah a lot of this soundtrack on the spy side was electric music which you don't get to see very often in the nancy drew franchise and i think it did really well my favorite track by far in this game is the purpose track it's another spy track so interestingly enough both of our favorites were spy stuff but uh it's super intense super upbeat it feels like you're in the middle of a train heist like chase or something while the song is playing All the tracks in this game are difficult to describe because, again, a lot of them are electric, so who knows what kind of instrument it's supposed to be. But apart from the spy tracks, which really do add to the, the vibes of this game, even if I'm not the biggest fan of those vibes, you have to give it to the bonus track here, Kate. So I, I think this is what this game is probably best remembered for when it comes to music. Totally, and it even adds that there's an entire puzzle revolved around the song, making it that much more cool. So, in this game, of course, it deals a lot with Nancy's mom and her flashbacks, and we always see Nancy's mom playing the piano, or teaching Nancy to play in her little piano lessons. And this is the theme of Nancy's mother. No one can forget it. Once you hear it, it's etched into your mind. After I beat the game, and we get that little conversation between Nancy and Carson, Carson's talking about the piano. I think they're, like, replaying the song or something. Yeah, and they're finally having oh. a discussion about their mom. And oh my gosh. That, to me, is why I call this one of the more sentimental soundtracks. I, I, could, I couldn't give a damn about, like, <laughs> it's such the a... bagpipes or even the, some of the spy music. It's and all the... about the Kate track. Like, uh, focusing a tad less on the music, it's just so cool that, as for the puzzle, there's, like, a part that's designated to Nancy, and a part that's designated to Carson, and then to Kate. It's just, uh, it makes the track so much more emotional, and that's what it is. It's a beautiful track. Coming in now at number 20 on our list, it hurts to do this game anywhere but the top 10, but... Really, I gotta acknowledge that soundtrack in this game was kind of the Ghost of Thornton Hall treatment. 
we have game number 17, Legend of the Crystal Skull. It's an excellent music game. I like it more than Jamie does because I... Uh, I don't know what's up with Jamie, but <laughs> he I, just doesn't like it as much. No, I, I love the soundtrack, but you got to acknowledge that a lot of it is just strange ambiance and chatter noise. It's a strange game, dude. It's the black sheep of the franchise. Okay, okay, so be it, but okay. still. Let's talk about the track you just heard, Curio. I love it, especially the opening second. You get that record crack. The record scratch, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> like, it's, it's so good. so <laughs> nice. Wait, do you hear it at Zeke's? You hear that at Zeke's, you hear it uh, sometimes. Yeah, I was gonna say, you hear it everywhere, because I, th I thought of the record player that's at Zeke's. Mm -hmm. It's totally... I mean, it's called Curio. Mm -hmm. It's it's slower paced, it's kind of sad, and it's a sad game, especially when you like dissect Henry's character and everything, but it's perfect. Very bluesy. But it's not as good as my favorite track, another one of Julian's top 10. We have the Legend track. Legend, as I've mentioned previously with other songs like Storm from Warnings at Waverly, this tells a story. But this is the most intense story ever, guys. You got, I wish we could play the entire song here. We're likely not going to. But do yourself a favor and just type in Legend of the Crystal Skull Legend track. Listen to the entire minute and a half. It's so good. One of the things that I like about it is that it plays a lot more rarely than other tracks in this game do. So whenever you hear that first opening sly piece, I think it's the French horn, mm -hmm. that you know that you're in for a nice 54 seconds of music. So. <laughs> and then when the end of the track, it gets so loud, so intense, I was like, oh my god, I just wanted to turn behind me to make sure I wasn't being chased. And of course, I do want to avoid spoilers, but this track does play during the ending cutscene when you're first going into the Cobra reveal. Which is and so it's, perfect. it's made to be timed up so well to the way that that sequence plays out. Now, next, my favorite track in this game, I, I gotta go with Bruno. Bruno sounds the way that Jack Sparrow walks. It's a, it's a very, very squ like swanky and jazzy brass track that's full of all sorts of spooky maraca noises. Maybe there's a washboard in there. Very Cajun, very exotic. Bruno, to me, is such an interesting track because Bruno Bolle is one of the biggest characters in the franchise that the game kind of revolves around him where you hardly ever get to know that much about the man face to face. You, the only scripture of his that you ever really read is stuff that he wrote, and it was fictional, like short stories for tired eyes. You hardly ever see a picture of him. There's just one of him facing from the back in his picture as the Jolly Roger crew. And you never get to hear his voice like you did Dirk Valentine or any of the other characters in other games from the past. Bruno Bolle, as a character, is kind of just embodied by this single track in the stories that you hear about him. Mm -hmm. and, and it's such a wacky, all-over-the-place track, and that's kind of like what he was. Who who do you know who wears glass eyes and all this stuff? Like Has get, a pet iguana? Pet, 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 pet Iggy. Like, the list goes on and on. It's totally just supposed to be symbolic of his character. Bruno Belay would be an awesome Halloween costume <laughs> if more people got it, and also I only had one eye. Or if they knew what he looked like. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Well, regardless on that note, Bruno, I think, is just such a nice, charismatic track, and I wish that you didn't have to go into the soundtrack to realize that it was named after him. And then on that note, I do want to cover the ambiance in this game, because some of the tracks kind of fall off, they're just unpleasant, they have no melody, but one that sticks out to me is the Chatter track. Really, it's, it's just a quick thing I want to talk about. I love how distorted and garbled a lot of the horns and brass sound in it. It's not really a melody, but it's just such a haunting noise. Mm -hmm. I associate it the most with Renee's room. The hoodoo stuff that's going on, hoodoo, voodoo, whatever it's called. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just so naturally spooky. And it starts off with that French horn. It dissolves into something like, it's, it's like how a nightmare would sound. Exactly. <laughs> it sounds like a rainy fever dream of a track. Exactly. And then finally, for our closer for this game, we um, got to cover one of the upbeat tracks. I think we're going to cover Bayou. These only play on Bess's side of the game, so you don't get to hear them too much when you're messing around the Bole estate. But they're nice, they're upbeat, they're fast, and they kind of cover the more Zydeco, kind of jazzy New Orleans vibe, so they, they totally deserve some recognition.
Coming in now at number 19, this is probably the only time you'll ever see me fight for this game to be better than Crystal Skull, which I had to do in order to get it in this spot. We have game number 14, Danger by Design. So this opening track was almost my favorite, but I thought it makes such a nice intro. This Metro track only plays on the map screen in the game. It's a very nice sound to it, and it sounds a lot different from the rest of the game. So my favorite track by far is Moulin. You guys will all recognize it as one of the most iconic melodies in all of Nancy Drew music history. Like, it's just so good, guys. You get the... I don't know these instruments. Accordion. It's very. Oh, that's it. It's, it's very big on accordion. It's the game. accordion. That's it. This might be the most mellow soundtrack in the entire franchise, and I think that's perfectly embodied in my pick, Paris. Paris has the greatest, grooviest combination of saxophone and a super slow xylophone in it. I love the accordion halfway through it when that comes in. This whole game really did get to capitalize on a real jazzy but slow and laid back vibe that I think gives it a real tight soundtrack, while at the same time just a distinct feeling that's not really like up and bright fancy in your face like how Tourist was in Phantom of Venice. I, I, I do think that this game has a pretty good soundtrack in a lot of ways. Bonus trick, we have... It's very interesting, the fight trick for a, a very yes. interesting ending. So I think this might be the first track in this list so far that is a fight track that we think was, you know, really good. And by fight track, I also mean danger track, more or less. I think it's got a really nice climb in the middle. The bongos in this track really sell it. They, they, they just have such a, a real intense beat. The climb that they contribute yeah. to is great. Right, there's something like tribal about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a primal track. This is uh, that's the word, yeah. taping your hands up and getting ready for, to throw down. And, you know, e even though the, the actual sequence it plays in is slightly ridiculous, I like the track on its own. <laughs> yeah, it's a good standalone. Regardless, I think that Danger by Design is a very, you know, despite all the things I've said about it in the past, how mean I can be to this game, soundtrack is up there. It's so, so good to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. Alrighty, guys, coming in at 18 on our list, we have case number 22, Trail of the Twister. Trail of the Twister is so beautiful. That, that's the word that came to mind for me, because it encapsulates this little podunk town, as Scott would call it, so well. Yeah, I mean, that opening track you just heard, Bluegrass, is kind of like, you know, the nice, hearty, jolly version of this town. My favorite track definitely is Planes. Planes you hear uh, the most driving, though it's not limited to driving, you can also just hear it around the farmhouse and everything. It is so, like, emotion-voking. I don't know what it is about it, but it's like, it's a perfect mix of like high piano notes, violin, and then a banjo, which is just like that. Those three come yep. together. It makes this beautiful track. Yeah, it's got the southern twang to it for sure. And it's totally also uh, pretty relatable music for driving through Ohio cornfields, <laughs> which is what we've played it for. <laughs> One of the more laid back tracks in this game that I really like is Sleuth. I, I love the twang of the banjo in this track and just how laid back it is at the same time. It really is, to me, the perfect lazy day living on the ranch with the storm chasers kind of track, or the farm, whatever it is that they're on, the Canute farmhouse. And then finally, I wanted to cover one of the more intense tracks in this game, because this game has like three or four bona fide danger tracks, really, because a lot of the game is storm chasing, and that gets to be pretty intense. And so the one that I decided to go with is the storm track, mainly because of the trombone that just absolutely goes off after the intro. <laughs> I can figure it too. It's so iconic. <laughs> yeah, it's some of the, it's, it's the biggest trombonage that you'll see in the franchise. Wow. 
With all that being said about Trail of the Twister, definitely a very a very hearty game for the soundtrack. Very it's a folksy. It's a tight fitting soundtrack too. For a, a location that I didn't think could be like encapsulated that well, this soundtrack did it perfectly. Coming in at number 17 on our list of the best Nancy Drew music of all time, we have case number 19, The Hauntings of Castle Malloy. Now, I know that some people are going to get up in arms about this, because I've seen a lot of people go to war and say that this is their single favorite soundtrack game, and I totally see where they're coming from. So this game has a monopoly over the bagpipes that Silent Spy could never aspire to have, and I really admire that for one thing. You hear it in that opening track, Grand, as it begins to develop more. But it's also got a nice pretty harp. It's it really is perfect music for exploring this decrepit rundown estate of the Malloy Castle. Mm-hmm. It's so it, I mean, I like how dramatically it shifts. It's so quiet with that little plucked harps accord and everything. Yes. And the transition to the loud and booming bagpipes, it's so good. Such a dramatic soundtrack, yeah. Uh but my favorite track is definitely Fiona. Fiona is the overarching melody heard in other soundtracks of this game too, which is kinda why it takes points off, is because Fiona is too good that other soundtracks just copy it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a musical motif, to be sure. Like, that was totally on purpose, but it does get reused more than a few times. It's so scary. It's, it's perfectly spooky, which is just, it goes hand in hand with the castle so well. I don't, it could possibly make Julian's top 10 favorite tricks. I'm not sure. That's something I haven't thought about. But it is, it's so good, guys. And it, its melody is famous. My favorite track in this game has to be Brendan, because as I've always complained, this game had such an inconsistent tone about whether it wanted to be serious or silly, so I do like getting to see the one silly, goofy melody in the game getting a lot of limelight. It's got a real kooky whistle to it, it's kind of clumsy in its beat and the rhythm, and I like that. It's, it sounds real disheveled. It's, it's again, Scooby-Doo kind of music, if you <laughs> ask me. And I, I know that some of you guys probably just hate how we reduce, <laughs> how we reduce some of these beautiful soundtracks to Scooby-Doo music, but that, that's a compliment. <laughs> you would better believe it. Uh, and then the bonus track. It's not an original, but, I mean, darn is it fitting. We have the Drops of Brandy, which is heard in the, uh, it's heard in the bar, the Ten Raven Pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or no, the Screaming Banshee Inn, Ten Raven Pub is from Oh, Silence yeah, Pie. I'm tripping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where they got to showcase all the traditional Irish folk music. So there's Drops of Brandy, and I think there's another one that I, I don't remember the name of particularly. And it totally is a tone shift from all the ghostly, spooky Banshee noises that you hear out at the castle. Mm-hmm. It's like a, go to the pub for this cheerful music because of how spooky the rest of the game is. Yeah, it's, it's a nice retreat from everything else. Definitely. Coming in now at number 16 on this list, we have the final of the first three franchise games, and that is Message in a Haunted Mansion. I am proud of how far up on this list this game made it, given it's the third Nancy Drew game of all time. Uh, it's really good. <laughs> okay, so I, would, I wouldn't bury the lead right here. This is definitely a looser-fitting soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I mean, the developers totally thought so, assuming that they thought they could get away <laughs> with it. copy and paste it in another game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they totally thought, yeah, this is a little universal. Let's, let's roll with it. It's very simple. You know, that's actually the one word I would use to describe it, is simple. Yeah, it is a very simple soundtrack for sure, and it relies a lot on the piano, which I think is what makes it pretty versatile. Again, why they thought they could copy-paste it to another game. <laughs> <laughs> Message in a Haunted Mansion was the game that her interactive found their voice on. I yeah. think that's when they really nailed down the formula, they got what they wanted to do, and it, it's still a good game to this day. The music is my favorite part of it. Let me cover my favorite track, Entry. Entry 
for sure lock in my top 10 favorite of all time, which is ludicrous to say. It is so simple. It's almost just repeated every three seconds, but it's so successful. It is great sounding and it fits this haunted mansion vibe perfectly. You know why I think it's such a great trick is because, well, it's just, it's looped, right? Like every 10 seconds or something, making it like, like I can, I can see the people typing away. This, there's no effort that went into this soundtrack. It's not good, <laughs> but yeah. listen, okay. I think it's great because there's so many hauntings, very subtle hauntings that happen. And this is the music that's played the most wherever you're walking and to just see a shadow slip by in the mirror or to hear Nancy, whatever it is, whatever small silly haunting it is coupled with this music it's why this game still holds up to this day my personal favorite track is probably the chinese one and i think that kind of deserves a shout out as being pretty much the only chinese influenced musical track in the franchise and like make no mistake there's a big difference between the music of shout out the water's edge and chinese music <laughs> oh, that's japanese some people would just kind of lump some oriental themes together but really the chinese tracks in this game just the single chinese track has this I believe it's called the pan flute or pan whistle. It comes in halfway through the song. This is the music of Nancy's room, the Chinese themed room. And I think it's such an enchanting woodwind sound that you don't get anywhere else in the franchise. I, th I just think the pan flute couples so well with the piano in this game and that they just form a really nice harmony. And the piano is totally the vocal instrument of this game. Yeah, for sure. That heavy octane piano. And then finally, the last track that we want to cover is MHM, Message on Haunted Mansion itself. This is a showcase of the more intense piano in this game. It's got a great climb to it, and it ends in a very intense format. I think it's just a great anthem of this game. That's really what it is, titled MHM. With that being said, despite its simplicity, it still holds up to this day, guys. I'm sorry, that could be very controversial on this list, but it's good. Coming in now at number 15 on this list, we have what I think I can say is the folksiest soundtrack in the entire franchise, and that is The Secret of Shadow Ranch. Oh, it's so good, so iconic. The ballad track is just the probably one of the first tracks you hear in the game. I've heard it play a lot as soon as it starts off and you're in Ed and Bet Raleigh's ranch house living room. And it's definitely just one of the cozy, comfortable tracks that makes you think of No Phantom Horse Can Get Me In Here, I'm nice and safe inside. <laughs> My favorite track by far is Francis. If you guys couldn't tell by now, I'm a really, I'm a sucker for like strong melodies. It, for me, there's some like underlying like love relationship thing to it. It sounds like a romantic song, which I think that's why it's called Francis. It's because of the huge underlying story of Francis and Dirk Valentine, which is just awesome. Uh, this game though, I mean this song, it's, it's just iconic. It's what you get stuck in your head. It gets catchiness bonus points. Now, one of my other favorites, and this one is quite reminiscent of the Sleuth track from Trail of the Twister, we have Sleuth from Secret of Shadow Ranch. Now, this one begins with a very almost jarring set of strings at the beginning. It's difficult to describe. Then there's then there's a bit of harmonica that comes in there to relieve you from the intensity of those strings. And then it goes right back into this vibe of just being very sudden in its stops and intensity. And so I think that Sleuth is a great track for poking around, especially poking around that pump morning after the first night there, when you're just kind of like, kind of stepping on some people's toes and putting your nose in places it doesn't belong, that sort of thing. So I totally think that Sleuth is a great track for being nosy in this game. The bonus track we're gonna cover is Drive. Drive is that super upbeat horse riding track you hear, especially when you get acquainted with Bob, you get out off the farm. This is the song of having your caravan together, circling the wagons, riding off into the sunset.
It, it's, it really is the triumphant track. The triumphant, that's the word for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Drive is definitely one of the more intense tracks that still keeps a nice upbeat tone to it. But these tracks are really just things that you hear when you're helping out around the ranch for the most part, and there's still a lot to be had in this game from going outside. So briefly as some alternate bonus tracks, I'd like to cover the desert one, which is just some real kooky, abstract, intense electric guitar that you hear when you're way out in the desert. And then of course the lands track, which is a really beautiful instance of Native American influence in the soundtrack. Apart from those, Shadow Ranch will always be, like, the comfort food of soundtracks in this franchise to me. There's nothing that feels so friendly and folksy and like home as the Shadow Ranch soundtrack. Coming in now, at number 14 on this list, we have one of the more modernized, electric soundtracks, and that is The Deadly Device. People probably know I'm extremely biased towards this game. It's one of my all-time favorites. It kind of pains me that the music is this high up on the list because I think it's beautiful. So that opener track right there, Research, is probably the closest you get in the franchise to hearing the gossip track from Waverly again, all perky and upbeat. This is the track to me of, you know, pulling an, an all-nighter to finish that assignment you put off. I love that tambourine backbeat going on, and then like the electric piano melody that starts to go on. It's it's such a nice combination of those two, because again, this, this soundtrack really did seem to experiment a lot with more unconventional electronic instruments. My favorite track, the one Jamie <laughs> coincidentally hates, is Discovery. Discovery is great, similar to Storm all the way back in Warnings at Waverly. It tells a coherent story while progressively getting louder and louder. It's such a natural crescendo, and I love its use of maracas to start it off. It's all yeah. so much fun. It, it sounds to me just like an unholy amalgamation of just <laughs> electric music, maracas, and it, it, it gives me the impression of like a train shovel, like a, a train yeah, shuffling there, along. There's like a train like... Um, no, it's not a train whistle, no, but there's there's some sort of weird thing in there. I dun 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 dun. It's good, okay? I don't care. And it gets the catchy bonus points, so it's it's definitely my favorite trick. And you don't hear it that much either, I'd say. So my personal favorite track in this game is probably one that's easily overlooked because of how slowly and steadily it comes on, and that is electric. Electric to me is the perfect personification of the themes of this game. It's very, very conniving, it's undercover, it's sneaky and suspicious, and at the same time, there's a hint of danger to it. The way that it slowly begins to progress, and the more sounds that come into it, the way that the bass starts to drop playing, like I said, I don't know what to call these instruments because it's totally 100% electric. Electric piano, just complete music software. Across the board, it's just a catchy trick. It's just a, crutch, a catchy game. This one not so much though, but it is so relevant and like, it's so evoking. The bonus track we're gonna cover is Loss, and it's what you hear when you first start the game and you get the whole cinematic of Nico's death fade onto the newspaper. Really, the Loss track is one of the best, you know, uses of emotion in a soundtrack. It's like, game. yeah, it's a really powerful violin that just makes you want to tear up when you listen to it. You can tell, stand alone, something really sad is going on. The cello at the beginning is, you know, a mopey, kind of, yes, even steady start. I could take it or leave it, but when it breaches that, that swelling point where all the strings come in, that's what really gets you in mm -hmm. the soundtrack. It's definitely different from every other track in the game, but it serves a different purpose, so I think it's super cool. Coming in at number 13 now, we have one of the more impressive 
entirely atmospheric soundtracks in this franchise, and that is The White Wolf of Icicle Creek. The big takeaway from this game is that it's a very, very tight soundtrack. You could not mistake a single track from this game for anything else, but that doesn't mean all of it is so good. A lot of it is cold ambiance. Cold is the word of the day when it comes to this game. Harkening back all the way to Tomb of the Lost Queen, it's kind of like there's no variation between the tracks. There are the all... instruments. Exa yeah, you know, it's all reused stuff, but the reason it is significantly higher on this list, it almost made top 10, we were debating it, is because each track is great. It serves such a good purpose and it would, they nailed it. Something I need to cover, so it's recurring in a lot of tracks, but it's most prominent in my favorite track, Icicle. You get these really sharp, high-pitched piano notes that I think are supposed to be of sim symbolic of snowflakes falling to the ground. Oh, yeah. And I think that's so well done. You hear, I mean, you're gonna recognize it right here in Icicle. It's totally a bunch of xylophone, too. Xylophone and that creepy whistle is what makes mm -hmm. a lot of the soundtrack sound so cold and chilling. <laughs> It's, it's so, it's so good. Even the relatively warm sounding tracks like Crackle, which is my personal favorite, you, you gotta acknowledge that it's still got those same two instruments that make you feel like, yeah, you're warm, for now. It really does just have an impending feeling of cold to it. And then finally, now this is a real tricky one, we had to take to the Discord to figure out how to categorize this. Mm -hmm. Probably easily the best track in this game. Ooh, that's a hot take. Okay, maybe not, but one of the coolest tracks in this game, one of the best in the franchise, is Olympic. Yeah, but there is a big, big problem with this track. Well, it's not in the game. <laughs> it was cut from the game. Such a cool track, such an upbeat track. It's got a strange choir in it that comes in halfway through. Uh -huh. Really, really emblematic of Yanni Vokstaya's character. Totally. The, the Olympian and trying to train to be the best, having to watch over your shoulder for, you know, the Fredonians throwing bombs at you. So, I was actually debating with Jamie whether it's okay to include it. It's not in the game, but you can see, they, they got its file or something, they got its original track, and it's beautiful. Yeah. It's so good, guys. It's a shame it doesn't play. I think that that's the main reason why we decided White Wolf couldn't make top 10. It was originally supposed to be there, but we decided that if one of the best tracks in the game didn't even make it into it, well then what are we even grading anymore? How the, how the song is in the game, or if it's just a part of the soundtrack? Mm -hmm. So I think we found a nice middle ground here at 13. Like, I don't even know where it would play. It, it, exactly, there is no spot where this game would play, because it's too cinematic to be anywhere but a cutscene, and there is no cutscene in this game that has this triumphant vibe to it. Regardless, Olympic is such a solid and upbeat, triumphant track that I think really needs to be shared more. Seeing as pl a full playthrough of this game, you'll never hear it. Coming in at number 12 on our list, we have case number 20, Ransom of the Seven Ships. Uh, now hold your horses, everybody. This this game, I'm gonna stand by it. Great soundtrack. Oh, it's so good. They, Such they, a fun soundtrack. So this is where it differs from Capu Cave, is while they're both tropical, there is so much more going on in Ransom of the Seven Ships. There's so much more variety. There's distinct tracks for sailing. There's distinct traps for underwater. There's like driving in golf carts. There's everything. The steel drum in this game makes the soundtrack so fun, bright, and cheery. Like, it doesn't even matter that Bess is being kidnapped and that she's, <laughs> she's somewhere hidden. I'm just schmoovin' when I hear the soundtrack. <laughs> that, that drum at the beginning of Island, it's, it's throughout the whole thing, really, in a lot of the tropical tracks. It makes you think of the Caribbean. So, let's talk about my track. Definitely in my top 10, Julian's top 10 tracks of all time. This track is so amazing. It's the Johnny track, guys. I, I, I guess- It, it sounds like it belongs in Pirates of the Caribbean. That's totally what they were going for with that cello. Honestly, I think it's a terrible musical representation of Johnny as a character. <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's no reason this makes me think of him. This makes me think of just walking up the dock as the tide is coming in. But it's so catchy, guys. It's those catchy bonus points again. It is amazing.
But to me, my favorite track in this game is a lot different. It's, to me, it's the slowest track, probably. It's such a good one for the imagination of this game, and that is Toro. <laughs> Once again, we have the Spanish guitar returning with a vengeance in this game. <laughs> and so, to me, this is on par with, like, the culture track in Labyrinth of Lies. The Toro track in this game, to me, is a very, very somber and melancholic track. And what I always think of when I hear it is El Toro beside the fire with his remaining men. And they're trying to entertain themselves, forging for food and laughing at these funny-eared bats and everything and he's sitting by the fire, grimly writing in his diary on how to find his treasure if it never gets back to his rightful king. Mm -hmm. And that, That's a really good, like, description of it. Yeah, it's totally... Sounds like this track of El Toro beside the dying fire, knowing that he's gonna die on this island in all likelihood, and that this is where he's gonna spend the rest of his life. Now, the bonus track has to be Underwater, because it's so perfectly fitting for Underwater. There's something like... It sounds like... It sounds celestial. Yeah, it's like rays of light coming down through water is what mm -hmm. it makes me think It of. sounds like there's like artificial bubbles coming up from it, too. You, I think there's even like a whale call somewhere in the background of it. I mean, kind of sucks that you have to listen to it when you're doing Underwater Sudoku. And you gotta love that swell of strings at the end, when it finally just quits all the foreplay and gets really intense with that Underwater soundtrack. Yeah, it's very good. I didn't know that underwater could be captured so well, like musically, but uh, that's the trick. Okay, time for some moral qualms here, because this is one of the games that I wish we could have fit into the top 10, but there were just a few more that deserved it a bit more. Mm -hmm. Game number 11, at number 11, The Curse of Blackmore Manor. Curse of Blackmore Manor is an outstanding music game. The music alone adds so much atmosphere to this already beautiful manor. It's just so many tracks that are so nostalgic to me, growing up and listening to memoirs and all that. We'll begin with that Renaissance track because it's got, it's such a sultry set of strings there. The cello, I think it is again. Cello is a pretty big piece of glue that holds together the soundtracks in this franchise. It's a very, very moody soundtrack, and I think that's great. The moodiness in this game is like it's super melancholic. I, I hate to use fruity poetic words like that, but that's that's the word for this game. My favorite track in this game is by far Memoirs. Uh, no doubt alluding to Nigel's, <laughs> Nigel Mugerji's Memoirs he's typing off. For some reason, when I think of this game, I think of dreaming. And dreaming is a very important component of this game. There's Probably multiple all the freaking nightmare sequences. Yeah, there's there's multiple nightmare sequences, but there's something very like peaceful. There's something calming about Memoirs as a track that just wants to put you to sleep. And I feel like that hand in hand, it goes with the nightmare sequences in this game. <laughs> yeah, the this is the this is the song that puts you to sleep, and then uh, the Bridget song gives you the nightmares. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Man, Memoirs, I love how it just, it's nine piano notes or so that just keep on fading in and out. They swell in the middle and go for like the first 15 to 20 seconds. And then that cello comes in and starts to get real intense. I, I like that. It such a nice swell. I love the decline on the cello though. It's such a moody fall of power for that cello that had <laughs> such, such a spotlight in that track. Up next for my favorite track, we have the fairy track. Kind of reminds me a lot of, you know, the monolith track from Secret of the Scarlet Hand, but I think I prefer this one because it's got a real mystical feel to it, of hence being named fairy. It The whistle part of it makes me think of being down in the glow stick lit secret passageways and looking at all the different puzzles about alchemy and stuff like that. Really, Fairy is one of the prettier tracks in this game. It's not threatening, it's not very ominous, it's just a wonderful, curious track that I think does a really good job of accentuating the fun of exploring this centuries-old manner. 
And then finally, for our closer, we have Empire. Empire is a good heavy octane piano piece that could give Message in a Haunted Mansion a run for its money every now and again. What I love so much about the Empire track is how it starts off so playful. It's kind of like an inverse Moonlight Sonata. Beethoven almost is what Ooh, it, I can see that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's got similar vibes to it. But what I really, really think stands out about this track is the last verse, or how it repeats itself. The piano and the strings go down an octave. Mm -hmm. And it suddenly takes a very sharp turn to a very, very ominous and threatening kind of piano. And what I always associated with so much is that last visit with Ethel Bosany when she tells Ooh, you yeah 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 when she tells you that you're not going to be welcome at Blackmore anymore once I get the authority so often Kevin Manthe likes to do these gradual crescendos of higher octave notes and everything this is like the inverse of Kevin Manthe's doing and it played out so creepily so perfect to the setting and yeah i mean you bringing it up Ethel Bosany totally goes hand in hand with it such an ominous game for soundtracks. Always feels like you're being watched. I think it's time we get into a little bit of that organ bias that I was talking about in the beginning. So coming in at number 10, we have The Haunted Carousel. One of the things that I think was great in this game is that it kind of did beat Midnight in Salem to the diegetic music part of the games, where you got all these great tracks coming from the carousel, the band organ on it. And so, you know, the first one we just played right there is Carousel A. It's one of two tracks, and Carousel B is personally my favorite. And we'll cover that in a minute. But first, I think Julian wanted to cover hits. Okay, totally my favorite track is Ballroom. It's like a creepy, low-octane carnival organ. Yeah, that carnival organ. Yeah, it is so creepy, guys. It's one of a kind. Now I guess we'll cover my pick right here, so that would be Carousel B. Carousel B is, you know, same instruments as the first carousel one you heard, except it's got such a catchier melody. I love the little breaks that it takes in between the crazy clicking and whirs of the organ to do the soft little refrain. And then I just love how quickly and suddenly it cuts right back to the thrashing words and reeling of the organ. I love I love that a, a puzzle is centered around it. You need yeah. needing to match its theme like entirely. That's so cool. Playing it on the harmonica. Like that, that just adds elements to the song that most songs don't get to tap into. Little bits of this track, I gotta admit, are a little bit loose fitting, but they get made up for with the organ and the ballroom and parts like that. In case in point, for one of our bonus tracks, we have Miles. So Miles is definitely the sleuth snoop track of the game, and I think that's pretty perfect actually, because the way we meet Miles is by him like, we d we're unaware of his presence and he's stalking us sleuthing. Like that, that's yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, it's just very fast plucked strings. I think that's really cool. It's nice and upbeat. It's a happy track. Mm -hmm. So totally, that's a good pick. Miles for sure is a very fun upbeat track with the plucked string. Uh, I, I feel like it is pretty loose. You could kind of pull it out and put it into other games. It doesn't necessarily make you think of a carnival. Yeah, but it's catchy. It is catchy. It, it, it embodies Miles the Magnificent Memory Machine yeah. so well. And then finally, I think we gotta cover the Prowl track. Prowl is the track of prowling around. It's, mm -hmm. it's very sleuth. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about being very shrewd. This is the music of going to that carousel the first time, not to ride it, not to have fun, not to get that brass ring, but to start looking around for clues. One of my favorite parts about this track, Jamie and I actually just caught it, but there's subtle finger snaps in the background that keep in, uh, keep in melody. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a groovy track, really. It, it does kind of give the creepy vibes of a shutdown amusement park. Well, that's what I was going back to is there's this unexplainable carnival theme. Yeah. I don't know I don't know if it is the organ or what because there's not an organ in this track, but it just feels so carnival. <laughs> yeah. The, the whole game just has that eeriness to it that I think is enchanting. Its tone, mood, and catchiness is all there. Definitely it earned its spot at 10 on the top 10.
And now for Julian to lose his mind, we have his favorite, I think, what, one of his personal favorites. I fought tooth and nail for this, guys. I think it's amazing. We have, coming in at number nine on our list, game number five, the final scene. I, w I want to be very clear. I think this is a good soundtrack, but I do not personally like it. I, I, there's parts of it that I love. I love my track that my favorite one I'll get into, but I think it is the most unsettling and uncomfortable soundtrack in the entire franchise. It, thank you. That's a compliment because yeah. that's what it's going for. I know. This but is the most uncomfortable Nancy Drew game. Which is why I don't. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to this in my free time. Look, you, your feelings like that, like it. It just validates your reasoning. Exactly, okay? The final scene is so good. What you just heard is the sleuth trick, and it's the best sleuthing trick to ever come out of that type of theme of Nancy Drew soundtracks. And it comes at the at the best part of the game, where everyone's in that press box, we can eavesdrop everyone's conversations, and it's just time to put nose to the grindstone. You gotta snoop through everyone's belongings, and that's what you hear. It's so good. You can go ahead and cover your magic track now. That one's also I, creepy as hell. My favorite track in this game, first of all, so hard to describe. It, it's between Jamie's track, my track, and our bonus track. Uh, it's too hard to decide. Uh, but I went with magic. I, there is something magical about this track, guys. It is so good. It starts with like this train whistle, but I guess it's an organ. It's some instrument. sort of goofy pipe organ. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, it's something you would hear in a theater. Yeah. And where are we? It's a perfect. Theater. It's yeah. perfect. But the best part, one of my favorite parts about any track in any Nancy Drew history, is this downward spiral we get to halfway through it, where you get the cymbals clash. Ugh, what are all the instruments there? It's just light percussion and, and then, this piano going off in spirals. And then at the end, it just reverts back to that creepy-ass organ, guys. It's, oh, it's perfect. Okay, so my personal favorite track in this game is Maya, because it's the only track that sounds relatively normal. Uh, so this is pretty much just the anthem of the game. It's actually a waltz, meaning that it repeats after every three beats instead of four, if I'm not mistaken. The first time you see this, it's the opening letter of the game, and you're looking at a postcard of the theater, and it says... Vanishing Destiny, and it's like the final show will be demolished in three days, and it really, it's a sad track. It makes you think of the theater and the history of mm -hmm. it. You hear voices talking in the background, like a crowd when you yeah. see it in the opening letter. Well, what I think about with this track is the days changing, yeah. and when it starts off, you get day two in the corner, and then you see the mob of protesters, or day three, and the excavation, all the demolition people are out there. That's what I think of, because this is the day-by-day -day transition, and the game gradually gets more intense after each day's passing. I think it's perfect. And you gotta love that steady and dramatic ending it has, just the flair it has when it goes out. Uh, with the bonus track here, we're going with JJ. JJ, for those that don't know the lore, and was the original owner of the theater. Not a good guy, kind of a cheapskate. His existence, Harry Houdini era, all that, it dates back to the early 1900s, and that's certainly the vibe I pick up on when I listen to this. We get like a French horn and a trumpet going on here, it's, it's very jazzy, definitely the most jazzy track in the game. But uh, midway through, we get this winding, really high-pitched like sound effect that it's it's the focal point of this game. Every every little trick has something that puts your it puts your hairs up, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely this part. This so I think it's cool that JJ got his own trick, uh, but it's definitely not the creepiest track in the game. <laughs> yeah, I gotta hand it to it. This game has the single best danger track in the entire franchise, and that's what's gonna be our closer for this one, because the danger track and final scene has just a haunting climb like no other. It's got that same piano that we've seen before, the percussion is going crazy in this track, and it's, you know, considering the circumstance that it plays in, I don't want to give too much away, but it might have something to do with the theater being demolished. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's so intense, and then the game changes around you, you have the compass turn into a timer, and everything gets so intense. Oh god, it's, it's definitely the best danger track of all time. Uh, 
All right then, coming in at number eight on this list for greatest soundtracks, we have one of the most diverse in the entire franchise, I'd mm -hmm, say. Definitely. It's all over the place, but in a good way. We have Shadow at the Water's Edge. Rightfully here, I love the divide between modern Japan and old school traditional Japan. And then the scary combinations of both. Mm -hmm. It's perfect, and it's something that Jamie brought up to me. Jamie analyzed it so well, but the intro track we played here, Ryokan, obviously it's traditional. You hear it in the Ryokan, which is a very traditional family-oriented like Japanese hotel, pretty much. It's so great, yet there's something haunting to it at the same time. The whistle in Ryokan is almost haunting, but it's such a nice, pretty wind blowing through the the cherry mm -hmm. blossom trees kind of track, which is kind of the more peaceful music that you get in this game. So in the same vein as Ryokan, you have the traditional track, which I think is my personal favorite. It's an acoustic plucked string that, very similar to Ryokan, a bit more of a melody that sticks to it, I'd say. It's really just emblematic of the Japanese Ryokan traditions of the Shimizu family. Okay, I love the traditional aspects of, of the soundtrack, but I'm also a sucker for its, its modern, crazy techno beats. My favorite one of which is Pop. Pop you hear on the subway, that initial subway puzzle really, but it's so good. It's so, it's also symbolic of like the times. You're riding in like these really like ad technologically advanced like train cars and everything. And it's so upbeat, you just, I just vibe with it. Yeah, it is a nice vibe of a song, that's for sure. So just a real brief one that we wanted to bring in as a bonus track for part of the spooky atmosphere. This track is just called Spook, and there's not really much of a rhythm, but a very, very interesting sound that I can never get out of my head. It's one of the most unsettling noises you'll hear in a Nancy Drew soundtrack. It, it, it's not natural. <laughs> it feels like a ghost is making it. So that was a real quick one, and now that we're through with that, I think it's time to get into one of the more iconic scary tracks in the entire franchise, and that is Kasumi. The way I think about it is like this really messed up lullaby. Yeah. And it gets creepier and creepier. More and more distorted. And it, it gets ambi ambiance there too. It, it starts Whenever to, I it, hear this actually, I just want to like, I want to take shelter somewhere. I want to be in the gardens area somewhere yeah. safe because it's that terrifying. It's got this weird droning airplane noise that goes through the second half of it. Like an airplane going overhead. It sounds like the beginning score to Clockwork Orange. It's... Such a strange pick for the music that is really, really haunting, unnatural to the ear, and just a terrifying development in this track that is so morbidly named after the deceased Kasumi Shimizu. Now, the reason that it scored so high up on our list isn't for its music alone, it's the importance the music plays into the story too. Of course, the big divide in the soundtrack themes is very important to the big divide in the actual Japanese culture between the old and the young, because it really is completely two different parallel worlds. It's apparently like that in real life, I've never been to Japan, but I'll take the game's word for it because it does a very big job of emphasizing how different these two worlds are. Coming in at number seven, we have one of the more ethnic soundtracks in the franchise and mm -hmm. i love it so so much we have game number 24 the captive curse Captive Curse is arguably the most fitting soundtrack to a game. I mean, it's so good, guys. Especially that opener that we played, Waltz. Waltz is such... so, so Bavarian. It, it makes me think of soft pretzels and, like, beer cheese. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of what the instruments are. Maybe an accordion? The beat goes really interesting in this track. That I, it's Like I said, it is a waltz. That's the title of it. 
So it actually repeats after every three beats, just like Maya instead of four. Mm -hmm. uh, my track by far is Mystery, and I don't know if it's played on a piano or if it's a glockenspiel for. Oh, that one's a piano for sure. Yeah, but that I, th choir I thought it was. A I was just gonna get to the choir. Yeah. There's like this child's choir that comes right in at the start. It, it's so good. Like, when I'm inside the castle, I'm never really scared. I feel very safe in there for some reason. Uh, but when I'm in the courtyard in this place, I just want to rush back into the castle. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously. The, the child's choir, her interactive doesn't utilize choirs enough in their songs. And when they did for this, it, it's a 10 out of 10. For sure. So my favorite track in this game has to be Spy. Spy is such a devious and intense track. I love the pluck strings and the real, real brief, what, like, eighth or sixteenth notes that are played on the violin. It's not pluck strings, it's just very sudden, sharp notes all going in a different order. It seems really, really hard to play. And you also gotta love that little tap on the glockenspiel or the xylophone. It's just very, very simple. Sounds like raindrops or tiptoes, something like that. The way that it just develops into the strings towards the end of the track just adds to the intensity of it all. Really, I think Spy is something to behold in this game. Maybe you want to take back what I said about Final Scene's Amazing Danger track. I mean, it's still just as good, but this one can rival it pretty well, and that is the Creature track in this game. So, Creature exclusively plays when the monster shows up, and boy, do you never forget it. Mm -hmm. Is there's a Gregorian chanting in the background. That's the best thing about this it's game. It's like their, Latin. Util their utilization of a choir. Just from start to finish, it's so intense. The way that the climb just continues yeah, so there, steadily. There's no room to breathe with this track. Exactly. And that that final, the, the payoff at the end, the payload with this track is crazy. Definitely one of the more loud and intense tracks in the entire franchise. It still remains nice and concise. And then finally, we have Girls as our closer for this game. Girls was actually almost my pick for favorite track, and that's because it's very similar to Mystery. There's not a choir in here, so Mystery gets the bonus points for that. But Girls is a very similar faint-sounding melody played on the piano, and then this gorgeous violin comes in. What this track refers to is the story that Renata tells of the two young girls who went into the forest so long ago, and only one of them came out. It's a very sad song about a sad story, of mm -hmm. course, and it starts to play into the idea of, if this monster is real, what kind of tragedies he's caused in the past. It is one of the most emotional tracks in the franchise. Captive Curse as a whole, it's beautiful. I give my hat off to Kevin Manthe for his use of a choir. I just, thank you. <laughs> you did it great. <laughs> but Come now we're moving on to number six on our list, guys. We have case number 13, The Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon. So this game is probably most famous for this melody that we're playing right here. This is this is one of the best musical motifs in the franchise because there's actually a very, very iconic different version of this song, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. But as for the meantime, let's cover some of the more intermediate tracks that just play throughout the game. I know Julian's a big fan of Explore. This song almost feels as though it should be played in Secret of the Shadow Ranch. It's very westerny, which is funny because there's actually another track in this game called Western, when there really aren't that many western vibes in it, other than its beautiful music. Explore is played on an acoustic guitar. It's almost like an acoustic guitar solo, really. Is it specific to a certain train car? No. I don't no, think it no. is. No, this plays throughout the whole game. I, yeah. I think I've heard this play in Copper Gorge, too. Yeah, guys, it is so good. I mean, Copper Gorge is a pretty western town. My favorite track in this game has to be Society. I think that Society has one of the prettiest and greatest comings-ons of any game. The climb is so good getting there, and I love the piano. The piano is so dainty and pretty, and it really does make you think of going on this solo voyage through the mountains in your train 
as Jake Hurley with his wife Camille and no one but that engineer on board. It's kind of lonely in a wistful sense. It's very sad in some ways, but it's got such a pretty beginning, middle, and end. It's a perfect track if you ask me. So this next track I don't think actually plays until you reach Copper Gorge, the midway part of the game, and that is the Western track. Western's got very, very simple vibes similar to Explore. It's all about just a slow-moving guitar, and there's maracas in the back occasionally. This little rattle on a tambourine or something, it sounds like a, a rattlesnake going off. Mm -hmm. It's so weird categorizing this game as a western themed score because that's not what you think when you look at the game. No, it's not. I, I just think of Train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. If Shadow Ranch was the game that kind of embodied the folksy and ho southern hospitality vibe of the west, that sort of thing, then this game embodies the Wild West and just the unknown yeah, territories. Definitely. But for a closer, we have to touch on Train. Train right here, this is the redux version of the melody that we began with. And it's known to play only during instances of extreme triumph, notably Jake Hurley's crazy Indiana Jones machine at the end of the game. Definitely. I can totally see it like just being like matched up with a train taking off. I think it's just so cool that they had the main melody of the game, that track titled melody, just be such a cool musical motif that eventually you get to hear this crazy roaring triumphant version of it. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the best musical highlights in this game, if not the whole franchise, and it's totally an iconic track and always will be. Well said, but now guys we are getting into the top five best scores out of Nancy Drew games. Oh man, it's... This was, I mean, you can probably deduce which games we haven't read, but uh, just know that this is actually truly where it gets to be almost interchangeable. So, why don't we start things off with number five on our list, case number four, Nancy Drew, Treasure in the Royal Tower. Treasure in the Royal Tower to me is a very, very interesting game with a brother game soundtrack wise being White Wolf of Icicle Creek. So those two games are kind of known for being the main two snowy games in the franchise, if you'd excuse warnings at Waverly for gradually developing into snowiness. To me, those two games are the most weather intensive. One of them is about you being outside and having to make sure you don't freeze to death, and the other is about trying to stay inside and keep warm as best as you can. To me, the soundtracks illustrate that perfectly, because the White Wolf soundtrack is all about feeling cold, whereas Treasure in the Royal Tower is all about feeling warm. Mm -hmm. Perfectly said. Uh, warm is the single word you can use to describe this track. I mean, actually, the intro track you guys just heard is titled Warm. Yeah, how so, about that? Uh, it just speaks true to it, and I love that intro track so much. And apart from the warm, cozy vibes of cuddling up by the fireplace in this game, you have a lot of French influence with harpsichord and some sort of clarinet. It's It all has to do with the Marie Antoinette historical ties in this game, but they're all very good. My favorite track, another lock in my top 10 songs of all time for Nancy Drew, is Somber. Somber is that one song that gets stuck in your head when you play this game. You hear it the most, it's got the most casual, friendly melody ever. It's all just about that pretty clarinet singing through the halls. There's something just rejuvenating in it. It's, it's relaxing to listen to. The y you feel warm. <laughs> it's got some good vibrations, that's for sure. Uh, my favorite track in this game has to be the garden track, and I like this one so much mm -hmm. because it's got like a scripted event almost. See, the first time, or at least the most prominent time that this track plays in the game, is when you find the secret passageway in the library, and it's this old study. You find a flip lighter on a desk, and you light a candle, and then the track begins as the candle melts down and it reveals that there's a key hidden inside of the wax. Oh, that's such a good scene. Now, as this song plays out, it starts to gradually just develop into itself, grow into the crazy song it's becoming, and you start to find all these pieces of documents and paper and stuff 
that start to tell you that Ezra Wickford actually adopted a Dexter Egan, and he was his adopted son who grew up here. It's being, a sad song. Yeah, and especially that last part, the, the last verse when it repeats itself, I think is one of the most sad and intense parts. That is the realization that you found out a dark secret, and you have to be very careful and watch over your shoulder, because you never know if someone might be watching you. Moving on for our bonus track here, we have Library. Library is probably the slowest moving track that we picked for this, and it's got such a nice spiral on that piano and the harpsichord. I'm gonna say it right now. This bit of piano right here, that's totally gotta be reminiscent of the spiral staircase in the library. That's that's mm, totally, yeah, what totally. It, totally what it makes me think of. I'll bet that they had this track designed and told them, okay, Kevin, I need you to make the musical embodiment of walking down a spiral staircase. Can you do that? <laughs> I'll see what I can do. The closing track we're going to play is TRT. That's its abbreviation and official name. There is something extremely royal about yes. this song. And it, it, it goes back to Marie Antoinette and royalty within the towers and everything. Mega harpsichord and mega string piano. Mm -hmm. It's like medieval almost. Yeah. And going with royalty. That's so cool. But it, it's so catchy. It's something that you guys all know. You surely listen to. Its melody is famous. It's, it's one of the faster paced songs in this game too. Mm -hmm. Really, tracks like TRT is what gives Royal Tower a very haughty, almost almost just elite feeling to it. It's it's almost like the soundtrack is looking at the other games and saying, I'm better than you and I know it. <laughs> at least it's saying that to the first three games. With everything we've mentioned, guys, Trish and the Royal Tower, it's it's everything. It's got tone, it's got mood, it's got catchiness, it's got nostalgia. You guys all know its melodies, it's iconic. So definitely deserve to be at least five on our top five. Coming in at number four, I want to just say this song and the next one were neck and neck. Thematically, they are very similar, but one just got a slight edge on the other. Mm -hmm. We have game number nine, Danger on Deception Island. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this, this, does this contain your favorite track of all time? It does contain my favorite track of all time. Well, I'll let you get right to it. So this is Jig you're hearing right now. Jig is the nice upbeat track. You gotta love it. Hot Kettle Cafe, Jenna Devlin's Crime Chowder. You know that she's putting something super addictive in that to make her entire town hooked on it. That's, that's the way it goes in Snake Horse Harbor. But without a doubt, the mystery track in this game. And interestingly enough, this isn't Jamie's favorite track, no. so I think it speaks volumes to the game that we are we feel so passionately about different tracks in the game. Mystery is it's my favorite track in Nancy Drew history. It, <laughs> it captures everything in one song. There's the sadness. The cloudy oh, gray day. The cloudy gray day, the sadness overarching Katie's boat and everything. There's happiness too. It just transitions from one thing so well. It's like waves crashing upon a shore. I think and it's, it's beautiful. I think it's so interesting to me that you see so much out of a very simple track. It just starts off with pretty much just piano and sad violin in the background. The, the song as a whole is definitely on like the slower, sad scale. But it's just powerful to me. Something about it like touches me to my core, and for that, it's my favorite trick. Coming up next for me, my favorite track from Deception Island, and I prefer this to Mystery by far, is Caves. Caves is really, I guess, meant for the Sea Caves, but I associate it most with Katie's Boat. This track, I, I'm gonna drop another song name here, Camille Sunsane's Carnival of Animals Aquarium. I know I probably butchered his name pronunciation, but you can tell that it takes a lot of inspiration from that old track. The, the, the harp at the beginning, it's like a very eccentric harp just getting run over, thumbed to death. 
and it just has a great horn in it after that. Kind of sounds like a fog horn in the distance. Mm -hmm. To me, this is the single most aquatic track in the game. And it's also got the same key piano that Mystery liked to flaunt throughout its duration. Next for our bonus track, we wanted to cover Dirge. Dirge is even sadder than Julian's Mystery track for sure. It's very slow, almost sounds like there's a foghorn in the background, and it's just got a very, very particular low tone to it that I, I really adore. I don't know why, but I associate Holtzgato with this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's him it's, protecting his lighthouse all by himself. Yeah, he uh, feels like a fisherman out at sea alone or something, or like uh, Holtzgato up in his white <laughs> in his lighthouse alone. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, fog rolling in and all that. Yeah, I, I can feel, I can sense the fog rolling in, a, a brewing storm or something. It's just it, all of these songs in this game tell a story, guys. If you're a little imaginative, you can picture everything going on, which I think is so amazing. And then finally we have Siren, one of the more abstract songs on this game, but I really, really love the ending to it. Because of the way that Siren ends after having all these pretty whale calls and all that, you hear it a lot at, at the lighthouse and also in Whale World itself, it's got this very pretty melody that just emerges right out of the end and ends on the most peaceful note imaginable. Overall, Danger on Deception Island is an outstanding maritime game. Great vibes for a foggy fishing town. But not as good as the vibes of an icy fishing town. Mm -hmm. And so for number three, we have the Sea of Darkness. The more ethnic version of Danger on Deception Island, if you ask me. Sea of Darkness, the, Jamie and I battled so long on where to place this because it has some outstanding tracks, one of the best tracks of all time in the word I couldn't keep. This Resolve track, the opening right here, is the menu theme of this game, and I feel like it was such a nice, slow, steady incline to introduce a player to this game for the first time. There's something so, like, cultural about it. Yes, you can it's tell very, it. very ethnic. It's, mm -hmm. it's all Icelandic instruments. You see that a lot in the, in the strings of the violin in this game. Or maybe it's the fiddle at this point, I don't even know how they're playing it. Julian, I think you should just go ahead and get into your favorite track, Rebuilding. Okay, Rebuilding, if you guys couldn't tell by now, I'm a sucker for choirs. I was in choir all through high school, and I just appreciate a good choir. The men's chorus in this Rebuilding song is 10 out of 10. It, the, I can feel the emotion in everyone's voice. It's powerful. It's telling a story of their lives rebuilding in this small little Iceland town. And I love it. It's getting, it gets gradually louder and louder. It crescendos so well. It feels like waves are crashing down on them as they're singing. It's just a piece of art in music form. My favorite track for this game has got to be All Hands. All Hands is one of the most intense climbs of a track that I think I have ever heard. It, it gets to be so intense, it's cinematic. This to me is what I think of when I hear the story about Captain Lawrence ending up crashing into the harbor, trying to get All Hands on deck as the storm rolls in, trying to get his men to steer them away from land so they don't beach the Heerlikide. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a it's one of the best intense tracks in the franchise that isn't a danger track. And I think that that is something to behold in a Nancy Drew soundtrack. <sighs> uh, 
It's it's so catchy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Real quick, we have two bonus tracks that we want to cover. The first of which being Festival. I think this one deserves a bit more limelight than the other. Festival is a real jolly track. It covers, you know, in the main town square where the annual Town Founders Day celebration goes on. The fiddle in this track just does not quit. It's very, <laughs> it's very, very, very celebratory. This is the time of year that everyone in Skiproth looks forward to when they get to celebrate their town's founding and the legend of Captain Lawrence and how he saved the town that one fateful winter after the volcanic eruptions. When I hear this song, I just want to start like break dancing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to break it down and go crazy when I hear this song. That's how powerful it is. And then our other bonus track, we have Waiting. Waiting, to me, is easily the most different song in this game. It is so out of place, so strange, but so, so good. I, it's a very, very simple track of just a single woodwind instrument. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a gamble and say this one is a bassoon. Could be a clarinet, who knows. To me, it sounds like it doesn't belong in this game. It feels like it belongs all the way back in sh uh to the lost queen no yeah. it doesn't don't yes it does it's it totally like the snake charmer no it's it's kind of like the snake charmer but it's it just feels like a snake itself slithering around you being watched is what it makes me feel like so what's the snake in this metaphor for this game i don't know maybe the culprit stalking it, magnus well, it's totally like uncomfortable it's always felt out of place to me though i gotta say well, I always thought that it was an outstanding and tone shift in the game that really I, I liked hearing because it, it was so sinister. And then finally, it's performed by Billy Wildrick, the voice actress of Elizabeth. This is one of the single most impressive songs, I believe, in the entire franchise. And it really is quite emotional if, you can, if you're a Nancy Drew originalist and consider 32 yeah. to be the last Nancy Drew game. Break down its lyrics, guys. Like, pull it up as a poem or something and read it. The word I couldn't keep. It is so powerful. And I love that it's... There's a puzzle. The end game puzzle revolves around it. Whenever uh, there's interactable music in the form of a puzzle, that just adds so much to it. And that song as a whole, all of its lyrics, they're so meaningful. To this family, especially. What really gets to me is that it's the credit song of the game. That's that's mm -hmm. when you really get to hear it. You get to hear the shanty version. You get to hear the music Vox version throughout the game. Yeah. But that final, final credit sequence. To some people, it'll be the last Nancy Drew game they ever play. Mm -hmm. That's that's the way it goes out. I've always loved that. We are down to two contenders, and one of them, I am personally not a big fan of this game. And despite everything about this game that can be so annoying, the parts of it that just get stale, the times I don't want to replay it but I always end up having to, it has got, without a doubt, the catchiest soundtrack in the entire franchise. Mm -hmm. Hands down. Coming in at number two for the best music of all time, we have case number 12, Secret of the Old Clock. Now, Secret of the Old Clock, I would have never guessed that this would merit such a high spot in any category, honestly. But then you gotta realize that, like, when my dad is humming this Amuse track when he's doing <laughs> the dishes, that, that shows how catchy this song is. Yeah, uh, you just heard it, Amuse. It's my favorite track in the game, but it's most fitting for the intro because, gosh darn it, yeah, that is catchy. It's, yeah. it's in my top five. It's oh, it's so good. The, the whole theme of this game is being screwball 1930s, mm -hmm. just like, jazz whenever, blues. If, if if you didn't know the track names and you just hear a piece, you're like, oh, that's old clock. That's old clock. Yeah, there's there's no mistake about it. Because it's so one of a kind. It's just old clock. It's that. It's the genre. Julian's runner-up favorite track, Urgent, has got the wood block. That one that can't be mistaken for anything else there, either. There's two outstanding driving tracks. And driving is a component of the game that I really didn't care for. But by golly, when Urgent starts playing, I am <laughs> jamming to this song. I'm, I'm running into everything. I'm going over all the potholes. I don't care because Urgent's on right now. Yeah, shut up. This is my jam. Yeah, it's so good. And there's an amazing wood block. It reminds me of a... 
the coconut thing with the horse. Oh, yeah, with Monty Pythons and the coconuts. <laughs> One word to describe all the music? I mean, not all of the music, because it does really range in emotions, but I would say, especially for Urgent, it's kind of silly. Yeah. That's what it's, it's going for. That's That's totally what it is. This game was satirical, and in a lot of ways, <laughs> these soundtracks really, really sold it. So Mystery, my favorite track in this game, has a killer trumpet with a bell mute. And for those of you who don't know, a bell mute is when you, like, you shove this cork thing down the horn of your trumpet, and it makes it sound so sly. It makes it sound like this. That is a bell muted trumpet, and it's such a classic sound of the 1930s. I love the saxophone that comes in after it. It's It gets to be so groovy this is such a groovy soundtrack even when it's trying to be sad music like let me play gloom here real quick gloom is still gonna get a, a bop out of me I'm, I'm gonna be like dancing in my chair to gloom mm -hmm. and when you get to more of those sad or slower tracks i think they're very symbolic of the lilac and as a whole and especially emily's character there's a lot of connections to be made because emily the entire mystery revolves around her and how she's borderline giving up in life and it's just, it's like music devoted to certain characters. I think it's so cool. And then as for the Humble track, Humble is just, you know, kind of like the poverty-stricken track of the 1930s, but it still maintains the nice high spirits. I, again, it's, it's the same beat with that crazy saxophone going off. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what's interesting about this game is you know it's from Old Clock, but all the songs still manage to be vastly different from one another. And that's what's so cool about it. And then finally, as our closer for Old Clock, we'd be remiss to forget about Common. Common might be the second most familiar and catchy track in this game next to Amuse. This is the music of the mini golf course, if you ask me. Because mm -hmm. Common is- <laughs> It's just because we've spent the most time on the mini golf course yeah, growing that, up. that bell muted trumpet, it, it really, really sells this game to me. It sounds so sly. And not sly in a sinister or suspicious sense, but this one's just got such a pleasant piano. I, I, you gotta love the little bridge with the flute in the middle of it, where the bell muted trumpet starts to go off on a solo. Oh, the whole thing is so good and just brings alive the feelings of the 1930s. Or at least I would imagine so, because we weren't around then. They could have really failed with the music for this game. <laughs> yeah, they really could have, but instead they ended up making the single catchiest entry in the franchise. Fight me if you disagree. <laughs> show me someone that says they don't like the soundtrack to this game, and I'll show you a liar. <laughs> for number one, though, I think we have the soundtrack that we concluded had just bulk bangers. There was not, there was maybe one song in this game that I wasn't a fan of, and that was the Danger track that only plays like once. And it's not even a bad Danger track. No, it's not. This this game, I, I believe, what, we have seven or eight songs to showcase. Yeah, we're just going to be showcasing the entire, entire soundtrack because that's how good it is. And rightfully so. Jamie and I's pick for the best soundtrack out of all Nancy Drew games is case number seven, The Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. I, I guess that's where that extra saved budget went from getting rid of a fourth character. <laughs> hey, if that's what it takes, I'll play with three characters every time for this music. Yeah, exactly. Cause oh. This track here, I'm alone. I think it's unanimous between Julian and I. This is the best track in the game. Mm -hmm. Playing we, the speakeasy. We couldn't decide who gets it, so we decided to make it the opener. Malone is so jazzy. I love that bass. I love the open up. I once used this song as the theme to an art project I did in high school <laughs> for a film class. That's that's how much I like this one. It's so jazzy. This is. You know, for the longest time, I thought this track was called Speakeasy. So did Julian, because that's what it makes you think of. 
Mm-hmm. It's it's just such a jazzy underground prohibition hangout. Now, harkening all the way back to Midnight in Salem's review, we talked about how bonus points for a great day and nighttime differentiation. Oh, yeah. Except it was just the same track take out a couple instruments. We get outstanding different tracks for day and nighttime. I can't choose between the two. I have scribbled down right here. I love day. Day is the real upbeat and pretty one. Oh my god, it's so tranquil, guys. You just go outside, and then, it, it, you know, it's actually funny, because this is single-handedly the music, what it did to me. When I hear this track, I just want to go, like, frolicking through the forest. <laughs> but, but when I hear the alternative, the nighttime track, called Night, I don't even want to walk outside. Yeah. That's how powerful the music is in this game. You have to think about how it manipulated you. The first time you played it, you have to admit, this music took some type of psychological toll on you. Night really could be my favorite track in this game. I, I think I'm making a, a change last second. Moon is not my favorite. Night is. Night has such a creepy, slow entrance with that plucked string. It sounds like mice running through under the floorboards, really. And then it, it goes through so many different phases. It sounds like the theme of an entire movie. Uh, it, it goes through so many different phases. It goes back to pluck string at one point. Never has uh, an entry to Nancy Drew music been so strong that it manipulates the player's gameplay. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, especially when you're a young child and you listen to this game. Don't even get me started on the ghost track, which mm-hmm. plays, you know, when the ghost dogs first come around. Ghosts, the song that when the ghost dogs attack is just a very frantic flute gradually becoming louder and louder and then like a low brass section comes into it at a point and then when the ghost dogs are at your window and the lights are going out it just goes full throttle and the track becomes so scary, so intense, especially to a young child. Even so, there's still more peaceful tracks to display in this game. Like, Moon is a super peaceful one. Nostalgia is a super peaceful one. Forest is the perfect in-betweener track that usually plays in the daytime, but it could be the bridge track to break from day to night. I can't I can't even properly identify the music for Forest. There's the soundtracks, the instrumentals. It makes me think of the cemetery more than anything. There's something indescribable about the music that makes you feel alone, which is a very important part of the story, you know? Sally's not there for you, Tucker Davidson's not gonna be out here however long, and all you got is just this really weird cast of people around you. None of them are there to comfort you, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, They're all just unsettling in their own ways. And this, coupled with the music, coupled with the scenery, ghost dogs, uh, it's just, it's so insane what it was able to do. Finally, the spooky track. It's a simple one, but I feel like the way that it begins cannot and should not be understated. It's such a light, spooky piano. It sounds like bones clinking together. The dogs themselves. Mm -hmm. And it It just has such a gradual climb. Really, this game, it's, it's probably the number one game I would go to for good music, for peaceful music. This is the music when you're trying to go to sleep. This is the music when you're trying to meditate. This is the music when you're trying to read. This is the music when you're just trying to manifest the spirit of Ghost Dogs of (laughs) Moonlake. Seriously, guys. And for all those reasons, just how it can affect the player on so many levels, it's beautiful distinction between daytime and nighttime, it has to take number one. Well... Thanks for sticking around for another great big Nancy Drew countdown, everybody. I'm sure that this one's going to be a lot more of an audio kind of experience for most people. Probably not going to have, like, any visuals on screen, so those of you driving home from work, looking at you, Mint, I'm sure that this will be a nice one for you to plug in over the aux cord. Mm Mm-hmm. We really just wanted this to be a nice showcase of the beautiful soundtrack of Kevin Manthe, 
who did games 1 through 26, and then Thomas Reagan, who took in after Deadly Device, and then the group of, inst of select artists who handled Midnight in Salem. We'll have them in the credits. Yeah, we'll have everybody in the credits, because uh, they, like, molded parts of our childhood. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> Seriously. Hats off to them. They were amazing at what they did. So, guys, thank you so much for listening. If you did all the way through, let us know what you think. It you Was Ghost Dogs controversial? Was Ghost of Thornton Hall controversial? Exactly. I bet it was, yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to continue the discussion, be sure to check out the description for a link to our Vote for Holt Discord. It's usually just a laid-back, casual place to discuss Nancy Drew soundtracks, anything you'd like Nancy Drew related, and Nancy Drew unrelated. We have some movies, TV, and music channels that are going up now, so that's always a fun place to hang out. Well, otherwise, thanks for checking out the video, everybody, and thanks so much for 275 subscribers. That's what we're at by the time we're recording this. Oh, yeah. could be even higher by the time it's up. Yeah, you guys make our days every time with uh, whatever it is, the discussions, new subscribers. We just love building this community and expanding upon it, so we're, we're here thanks to you guys. Stay tuned for episode 5, where we're going to be ranking them all in the category of atmosphere. Then episode 6, when it comes to endings, and then finally episode 7 with every game cumulatively ranked from the worst to the best in our opinions. With that being said, guys, have a nice day, and don't forget to vote for Holt. Vote for Holt.